Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. Beginning an investigation with a single body part is like beginning a jigsaw puzzle with a single piece. But that's how the following case began. Exhibit A. A human leg extending from just above the ankle to just above the knee washed ashore an hour from Niagara Falls. Police are called, and they in turn call in a forensic pathologist. The pathologist in this case has performed some 8,000 autopsies, but this will be his most memorable. It was a large leg, from, appeared to be from a large individual. It was uh, obviously a white person, and um, it was covered in algae and, and beach sand and debris and so on. There were no injuries that I could see, and it had been pretty cleanly severed at each end, but I couldn't tell whether it was male or female. Police suspect that the limb is from a man who committed suicide off a nearby bridge. And the cleanly severed limb is probably the result of a passing ship's propeller. In any unexplained death, pathologists hope to answer four questions. First and foremost, the identity of the deceased. Second, time of death. Third, place of death. Fourth? The death has to be categorized. Uh, in other words, is, is this a, a death due to natural causes, um, an accidental death, suicide, or homicide? Or, or finally, if it's not possible to determine which of those it is, it's, it, it's classified as undetermined. Given that the suicide occurred the month before, this also fits with Dr. King's observations about the leg. It was well preserved, and I thought probably that it may only have been um, in the water maybe a matter of days or, um, or, or a month or two. If the lake is the jumpers, Dr. King is well on his way to answering the four questions. But if things were that straightforward, we wouldn't be telling you the story. One of the first things Dr. King does is send the leg to a colleague who specializes in analyzing bones to determine age, stature, and gender. Using calipers, she takes various measurements of the bone. The big challenge in this case was that the remains were so fragmentary. All we had was a partial leg. When you're trying to get a lot of information from just a couple of parts of long bones, it's difficult. You're just looking at a small portion of the skeleton alone to try to reconstruct the individual's characteristics. With a pelvic bone, determining gender is roughly 95% accurate. With a skull, around 80%. But with just a leg bone, accuracy drops off sharply. The measurements of the long bones uh, from parts of the shafts and around the knee joint fell within the male range and outside the range for female measurements based on the reference standards so it would indicate the individual was a male. Based on this, the leg is sent back to Dr. King, identified as John Doe. That's when things take an interesting turn in the autopsy room. Detectives from nearby Toronto are investigating a missing person, a six-foot prison guard named Louisa Barston. What happens when a body or, or a body part is found, uh, there's a message goes out to all police agencies. So we, uh, we went down just to sort of take a look and see if, uh, if it could have any connection with our case. We were, felt it was a woman's leg, even though it was big. Um, you know, as big as what you'd expect a, a six-foot man's leg to be. Given this, Dr. King re-examines the leg. 
I noticed that it was not a very hairy leg. There were, in fact, uh, relatively few hairs on the leg. They were very fine and, and very short, and um, suggested to me that, um, that these, these were most probably hairs uh, that one would see on a female leg. John Doe could be Jane Doe, but did the leg come from the missing woman? Louise's husband, Henry Barston, a police sergeant, had reported that she'd gone missing more than a month before. The Barstons had already been touched by tragedy when their eldest son, Patrick, had been killed in an accident. That's when their grandson, Tim, had come to live with them. According to Henry Barston, on the morning of Louise's disappearance, Tim left for school as usual. But an argument erupted about how she had disciplined the boy for wetting his bed. The argument continued as they headed for Toronto. The closer they got to downtown, the more it seemed to escalate. At a red light, it exploded. What happened next would haunt him in the days that followed. Previously, when they argued, Louisa had gone to a girlfriend's for a couple of days. So Henry wasn't overly concerned when she didn't come back the next day. When Tim asked about her on the third day, Henry reassured him everything would be okay. But he confided to Tim's teacher at a parent-teacher meeting that Louisa had a suicidal fascination with Niagara Falls. After she'd been missing for 19 days, Henry reported it to the police. It didn't give me the impression of what normally happens with a missing person. And, and the family um, had reported that she had left, you know, for a few days before, but always contacted a member of the family and said, you know, I'm here, I'm there, whatever. And that hadn't happened. It was just a complete disappearance. Um, it's very unusual for somebody just to, just to disappear instantly. There's usually a trail to be followed unless the person is dead. Had Louisa Barston committed suicide and had the Falls hydroelectric turbine severed her leg? It was an examination of how the leg had been severed that blew the case wide open. Well, seven months before, I, I had been working on the um, dismembered remains of Leslie Mahaffey. And um, we'd spent a, quite a long time working on, on that case examining severed body parts, and particularly saw marks through bone. These are the cut ends of the, of the two bones in the lower leg, just above the ankle. And, and I think you can see on the hard bone, the compact bone, saw marks. He now had an answer to question four, the category of death. This is obviously not suicide, and the body being dismembered by the screw of a large ship. There's obviously foul play involved. The fact that Barston waited 19 days before reporting his wife missing troubled Tony War. I'm sure you've experienced where you've met somebody that, for some reason, and you don't know why, you may cause the hair on the back of your neck to stand up because you don't know why. The person who was causing the hair on the back of Tony War's neck to stand up was another cop, Henry Barston. What happens when a cop investigates another cop. The fact that it was a, a serving police officer on our service would, would cause us to be very guarded about the progress of the investigation. And the people in, working on the investigation were, were instructed not to talk outside of the investigation. It made life a little difficult uh, because we weren't able to go to our usual you know, resource, which is five to 6,000 people we have you know, working with us. We can't go to that resource so easily because we, we have to be careful that information might get back to our suspect. Tony War started by reviewing Barston's original statement. A 
conducted several investigations that have started as a missing person. You um, investigate the circumstances as they are reported to you, and usually you find there's uh, uh, discrepancies or there's, there's a hole in the story, basically, that uh, just doesn't make any sense. And uh, that's where you, uh, you know, you zero in and, and try and find contrary evidence to prove that the, uh, the account given by uh, whoever's reporting it uh, is, is not correct. Tony War zeroed in on the alleged story about the smashed window. According to Henry Barston, they had argued about their grandson's bedwetting. It came to a head when they stopped downtown for a red light. But had the window really been broken that way? When we're talking about when they parted company, that to me was, was fabricated. But if you could look at videotape of that interview, you would, you would see a, a marked change in the way the conversation was going when we're talking about things that were insignificant or things that actually happened and into the area where she, where she, when she disappeared that did not happen. It's just as important to disprove as it is to prove something. So for two weeks, police hand out flyers at the same street corner at the same time of day to see if anyone can corroborate Henry Barston's story. No one claims to have witnessed it. Nonetheless, Henry's car window had been broken. Investigators interview the garage mechanic who fixed it. He expresses doubt that anyone but Superman could have broken the window using only their fist. But there had to have been a reason to explain the fact that that window was broken. So that was a trigger to me that we've got to find out why did that window break? And when did it break? Because that's an important uh, part of the story. Around this time, investigators get a call from one of Henry Barston's neighbors. She claims that on the night Louisa Barston supposedly disappeared, she saw someone toss a large bundle into the trunk of a car. Under hypnosis, she identifies the man as Henry Barston. Police question Barston again, and this time ask him to bring in his car. In an aside, he mentions he's been having trouble with his grandson playing with matches. The next day when Barston brings his car in, it smells of smoke. According to Barston, his grandson Tim had set the fire. Police question Tim, who tells them he had promised his grandmother he'd never play with matches. We were able to seize the car, and in our examination of the car, we found that there was a, a deliberate attempt to burn the car. It wasn't damaged that badly. We found a, a makeshift wick stuffed in the back seat, and uh, it obviously appeared that whoever set the fire wanted the fire to burn into the trunk because the, the cur curled up piece of paper led into the trunk. So that sort of zeroed our attention to the trunk. At the center of forensic sciences, the entire trunk lid is removed and brought into the lab to be examined. The trunk had been scrubbed clean, but using special lighting, Keith Kelder finds specks of blood not visible to the naked eye against the maroon paint. He collects the minute droplets and sends them upstairs to Pam Newell. She has already received samples of the legs, bone, and deep muscle tissue from Dr. King to determine its DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it's the chemical blueprint of life. It's the map that, that defines who you are, who I am, and makes us different from everyone else in this world, with the single exception of our identical twin, should we have one. We ran the blood from the trunk of the car in the lane beside the extracted DNA from the leg. And we found that the profile from the trunk of the car matches the DNA profile from the leg. It now has to be compared to Louisa Barston, but no sample of the dead woman's DNA exists. 
Without definitive proof, the prosecution's case will be severely weakened. Then something else happened that threatened to totally derail the case. A Transit Commission employee said she witnessed a domestic argument at the place and time in question, and that the woman had yelled at the driver and punched the window. Well, that stunned us initially because we went, whoa. Everything we got so far says this didn't happen, and now we've got an eyewitness who says they saw it happen. Suddenly, the pieces no longer fit. Henry Barston had an alibi. Tony War spent frustrating hours and days investigating the transit employee's story. Eventually, he found transit records that proved that she was actually driving a subway train at the time and that she'd simply been mistaken about the day and the couple. But given that the only witness was also their only suspect, Tony War had a problem proving exactly how Louisa Barston had been killed. We had a difficulty in that we had no cause of death and we had no body. All we had was a body part that we could link to the car and we could link to her, of course. But we had no um, killing scene, no cause of death. It's very, very hard to prove that a person is killed if you can't show how they died. The case will be weak unless investigators can establish with greater certainty that the leg and the blood in the car are Louisa Barston's. That's when Pam Newell took center stage. Every person inherits half of their DNA from their mother and half of their DNA from their father. And that's because half of the DNA is contained in the ovum and the other half of the DNA is, com is contained in the spermatozoa. And they're one half of each of the pairs of chromosomes that make up your complete complement of chromosomes. And when that ovum is fertilized by the spermatozoa, that is the first cell of that new child. And that cell divides, becomes a human being. The DNA in each cell of that human being is the same as the DNA that was established when the spermatozoa fertilized the ovum. So Pam Newell asked Tony War to get blood samples from Louisa's family. He sent officers to France to obtain samples from Louisa's mother and sister. And he asked the Barston's other son for a sample. Henry Barston had already given police a blood sample after one of his interviews. By determining each family member's DNA and charting the relationship between them, she could figure out Louisa Barston's DNA. Then she compared it to the DNA of the leg and the blood found on the trunk of Barston's car. It matches. The frequency of occurrence of this composite profile of the leg, which matches the composite profile of the blood from the trunk, is very rare with, um, I believe, a frequency of less than one in 700 million. Police now arrested Henry Barston for his wife's murder. But investigators still couldn't prove how Henry Barston had killed his wife or whether the killing had been premeditated or accidental. With such a slender case, Barston's lawyer was allowed to plea bargain the charge to manslaughter, on condition Barston tell them about the killing. They had argued about Tim's bedwetting. He tried to walk away. But she was in his face, and he was next to his service revolver. He later claimed he didn't remember how many times he shot her. He cut her up with a hacksaw, then put plastic down in the trunk. Then he had a sickening realization that he had left his only set of keys in the car. Now Tony War had an explanation for the window. Barston had dumped Louisa's body into Lake Ontario 
and made up the story about her fascination with Niagara Falls. And there's no way of knowing whether that's what actually happened or if some other series of events occurred that resulted in the same, uh, same end. Henry Barston had allegedly said he would rather spend five years in jail than 15 years married to his wife. He was sentenced to 10 years in jail. He got out in four. It's been my um, experience when investigating police officers that they're not good at it because they're used to having their word accepted. They're used to having you know, whatever they relate accepted. And they're not that good at covering their tracks. As in many crimes, Louisa Barston wasn't the only victim. Tim has been passed around among relatives in foster homes. They lost a son, uh, tragically, a number of years ago. And I don't think that uh, their relationship recovered from that. And I think that's what uh, caused them to sort of come apart. Whereas in most cases, it would have ended in divorce, this one ended in murder. In the end, detectives and forensic scientists were able to piece together a human tragedy from a single bone and solve a puzzling murder. The stories in Exhibit A are based on actual cases.